So Matt, thank you for being on our channel today. Um, we were really looking forward to actually speaking to you. Uh, so uh, first of all, how are you doing today? Um, of course, in this lockdown, in this pandemic, in this everyone's stuck at home, it must be pretty boring, but I mean, how are you getting by? Yeah, uh, yeah. well, first, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, it's really cool to be here. Um, yeah, lockdown for me is, it's a bit of a weird one because it's where a load of like content creators, I guess this is now like their, their moment to shine because they've now got no other excuse to just stay home and make videos. But I guess yeah. uh, for content creators like us who do it all around racing and such, it's a lot harder. So it's um, it's a bit challenging, but uh, yeah, making making the most of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we do it about around racing and there's no racing, but there is some racing in sight, which is so exciting. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, this is Matt Amiss. He is a content creator on YouTube, very, very successful. Most, I would say, well known for his um, graphical videos, um, taking old retro Formula 1 race and putting modern day graphics onto them. We'll be getting onto them in a little bit. Uh, but again, firstly, Matt, just going back to you, um, we finally have some racing in sight. The Austrian Grand Prix, uh, just less than three weeks away. When this video comes out, it's a fortnight. In two weeks' time, it will be FP1 and the Friday practice sessions in Austria. I mean, it's without fans, yes, it's a, it's a late season, it's not as good, but is it just good to get Formula 1 back and motor racing back? And as you said there, you know, we, we finally have something to talk about on these episodes instead of just drawing on about what racing was like last year. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I, I can't wait for the first FP1 session to come. And it's obviously going to be a little bit different because we're not going to have a crowd there. But if a, a good silver lining for that means at least Carlos Sainz might at least have some screen time because the director won't be able to cut to a crowd shot now. Um, <laughs> so it means we won't miss any of the action. It's, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it's also played out not just for the sporting element but for tv as well you know to see all the concentration just being on the racing alone and not what's the surrounding aspects of it obviously it's going to be a little bit different in terms of like you know how they do interviews and also how the actual racing and podium go on but i think it's going to be a really interesting insight to see like how formula one have gone from you know trying to do the australian grand prix and failing badly in their favor or not in their favor even and now going to this to see what the switch is but um, yeah i'm just so excited to see those cars get back out of track yeah, it's going to be absolutely amazing. We've had eight days of winter testing, and that's the only thing we have in 2020. Like, that's crazy to think about. Um, so, as I mentioned there, you know, your, your big videos on your channel are the old style F1 racer with modern graphics. The feature that I absolutely love, um, the first video I ever watched of yours was the, the 1976 Japanese Grand Prix, of course, the, the first nationally te uh, internationally televised race between James Hunt and Nicky Lauda, of course, where James takes the win in a rainy Fuji. Um, and it had modern day graphics on. It was an amazing uh, video, but the first thing I noticed when I was watching it is I was like thinking, this has to be from official Formula One, like the Formula One official YouTube page. This is high tech, this is incredible. But it wasn't, it was from you. And I was blown away. It was absolutely incredible. Loads and loads of views on there. And it has become a very <laughs> regular recurring thing from you as well. You've done the 1950 British Grand Prix, the first ever Formula One race. And of course, you've designed the very special 70 year edition uh, graphics for the Silverstone Formula, Formula One coming back to the British Grand Prix. So firstly, how did you get into the, the role or the idea of doing those graphics? <laughs> And just how were the fun to design? You know, what was it like to actually make all that? Was it was it a, was it a heartache or was it was it fun? What was it like to make those amazing graphics for those absolutely incredible races? Well, it's the thing of where with my YouTube channel, the whole ethos of it is to try and get loads of people involved into motorsport, whether that's you know getting interest from uh, racing online, you know, go karting, or watching Formula One or Formula E. And one of the things I always feel like a lot of these championships don't really. Um, do a lot is, is to show how racing has properly evolved. It's all well and good, you know, seeing like archive footage, you know, from the 70s or 80s or even from the 60s, you know, of people racing, so seeing photos and such. But it sort of like was a bit of like a, um, a weird moment where you see colorization of photos from black and white and it's, you know, giving a new breath of uh, fresh air when, you know, it's been colorized so you can see people's skin tones and such. And I saw that from a photo, I think it was from like 1960 of an F1 race, from a black and white photo. Um, put into color and for me I was like that's such a good idea you know to like try and colorize you know black and white images and I was thinking how is that can you translate that into doing that with archival footage and it kind of just sort of reset on me that well from the 1950s all the way up to like to the late 70s many of the F Formula One races didn't have any graphics whatsoever on them let alone you know little graphics or lower thirds or anything um, and sort of my sort of forte is doing a lot of graphic work, a lot of video graphic work in motorsport already. And I kind of thought, well, why don't I sort of try to recreate some of the graphics and do like a montage of different little iconic race clips and such and put that together. And then, um, you know, 
doing that graphical work, you have to be really precise because you know the Formula One community, as dedicated as it is, if you just get like the wrong font or the wrong spacing, they will yeah. let you know very loudly that you've uh, got, it, <laughs> yeah, got it wrong. So you have to be really particular and uh, finesse it. And um, yeah, after the first <laughs> montage video I did of it, that went stupidly viral, which I did not expect. Um, and then. Yeah, the idea sort of just gotten bigger and bigger, and you know, James Hunt has always been um, one of my favourite Formula One drivers. You know, people really rate you know Michael Schumacher and Nicky Lauda, and my one of my favourites was just James Hunt because of his character and what he did for the sport. And you know, um, the last race you know was made famous by the film Rush, and um, yeah. it's one of the world's most famous races because of what happened at the end. And. I just wanted to see if there could be a, like a retelling of that story in modern graphics, and just so people didn't see it in like a cinematic way or like a yeah. weird highlights compilation, you know, done by Formula One. I wanted it to be as authentic as possible, and yeah, people really loved to watch that, and so I did that, and then did the same for the 50th race. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, for me, is what it it helped me. It, to be honest, it helped me actually kind of understand more and actually keep enthralled in these older races and as you said there you know about Rush obviously one of my favourite movies one of Formula 1 I mean motorsport in general community is one of obviously a very adored race especially because they get a lot of things right especially in that race uh, and it was just absolutely incredible to watch um, I was completely enthralled about that designing the 7 year um, the anniversary graphics for that um, it must have been really special for you you know to, to, to celebrate this landmark you know Formula 1 is 70 years old for the British Grand Prix as well, you know, Formula One, you know, the first race at Silverstone, it must have been special. Was doing the 70 year anniversary one very, very special. And of course, uh, you know, selling it to Formula One and getting Formula One, or trying to get Formula One involved uh, in those graphics. Yeah, I mean, so I've got a great relationship with the guys over at Formula One, you know, ever since I started doing these compilations and such, um, they've sort of very early, uh, very early on, they got in touch and was saying that they were great fans of it and stuff, and any way they could sort of try and help out um, to sort of try and do some of those graphics because they've asked before uh, when I've done the switcheroo of like, you know, putting old graphics onto modern footage, that's when we sort of talked about, oh, they can share the footage, obviously, because it's their, their, it's their, their rights, but then they ask if we could sort of work together. And so they've always been a bit of a big fan of it. And so the idea of the 70th anniversary is something I had in my, on my radar for so long um, just because I really wanted it to be like a... Because everyone on that day, basically what it would be that everyone on Twitter in the morning would share like a photo of the anniversary and then that's it sort of done. And then yeah. it's because it wasn't even televised or anything, that means no one's actually seen the footage or know what the story of the race was apart from you know, just from a blog post or anything. And so, yeah, that's when I was like, right, I want to try and make this a really special moment. And obviously, because it's the 70th anniversary, it's like if I don't do it now, then I've got to wait another 10 years and then that, by that point it would be even harder because I'll have less resource and by that point I might have been moved on to something completely different. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's all like, yeah, I had to sort of really do it. And I wanted to really honour the race because obviously a lot of the guys who were in that race are no longer with us and I wanted it to not be like a flashy sort of piece or like misconstrued anything. I wanted it to be like a pure racing sort of story. Um, and then yeah, it's through those contacts with F1 that I was able to actually get, you know, great commentary as well uh, from Alex Jakes. And um, yeah, it's, it's, the reception has been incredible. And from what you can say, um, for anyone that's watching who might want to get involved with Formula One in the future, we've had people before who've said things like, you know, never take no for an answer, or the worst they can say is no. But how did you acquire the, the contact in Formula One? Obviously, as much as you can say, I don't want you to spill too many beans if you don't, if you don't want to. Um, and, and how would anyone go about, you know, possibly getting into kind of the Formula One, the official Formula One world, whether that be the media or, you know, maybe making something for them in the future? How, what would kind of be your advice to anyone watching this who wants to get involved with, with Formula One like you did? Well, I think the best thing to do is, it's always good to have a goalpost. So it's, um, it's always good to have like something to aim towards, but that shouldn't be your first destination to go to. So for example, yeah. it's always been a dream of mine to do stuff with Formula One. However, when you're like sort of 16 or 17, so you know, starting to find your first proper job, it's not going to be realistic for you to get that job straight away with no experience or anything. So I definitely say it's all about practice and a lot of experience, um, doing sort of odd jobs where it's just getting more like bank of what you've done. So f up until this point, so before Formula uh, One, obviously I've been working in Formula E for the past five, six years. Before that, you know, doing racing with my own family and such like that. 
um, and just doing loads of different graphic projects for different companies and naturally the way you sort of make contacts isn't someone will refer to you and then you've made that establishment, it's someone either recognising the work you've already done or doing favours for other people and then they'll remember you next time for when a job comes up. So for example I've just made a contact um, at Ferrari um, purely because there was a uh, uh, they've released some historical footage and um, they needed some help with some location for that and so for F1 sort of put me in touch because of that sort of uh, crossover and so that's sort of the way you sort of making the contacts it's not um, just hoping that you get the job straight away it's yeah a lot of practice and a lot of um, a lot of experience and then eventually you'll make your contacts through there but it's always good to have like a uh, a goal so yeah to like sort of work in formula one but then it's always the thing of like once you're there as well it's where you can go a bit further yeah i mean the graphics that you were on about there just before i, I was watching the 70th anniversary ones and i was just blown away as to how good they actually were how realistic they were so obviously credit credit where it's due um so obviously since you do like you know formula one graphics it means that you're more or less a Formula One fan. Um, how did you get into the sport in the first place? How did you come across it? Was it the whole typical, oh, my dad watched it, my granddad watched it, or did you find another way to discover Formula One? It was a bit of a weird one. So um, my aunt and her husband, um, they do a lot of classic car racing at Goodwood. Um, they're big classic oh, right mini on. fans, and um, yeah, they race with uh, Austin A40s. And so ever since from a, like an early age, they've really got me into sort of not racing myself, but into the racing world, as it were. Um, so, you know, whether that's giving me my first PlayStation with Gran Turismo on it, or, <laughs> you know, taking me along to my first race, as it were. Um, but the, the funny thing is, though, is that um, I didn't really get much into Formula One until sort of later in my life, because it sort of, I, I went down the route of, you know, creating sort of videos for social media and such, and got a job in that area, and then a job opportunity came up to uh, do that, but for Formula E. And that's when it really then sort of took over everything of, you know, making my, my career in motorsport. I never really saw, saw, saw those two uh, overlap, as it were. Um, but that's really where, where sort of my sort of, fandom comes from uh, F1 is yeah again sort of through family but it's through my aunt really because my my core family aren't really sort of met uh, petrol heads or anything like that <laughs> yeah I mean we're sporting to a few people where they just don't really have any kind of connections to Formula One in, in, in that way so you said that James Hunt was like one of your favorite um, F1 drivers of all time is there anybody in the modern kind of era in Formula One that you've maybe kind of looked up to or maybe respected a bit or are you really on the fence with everybody and you're more of a I don't really have a particular favourite. I just kind of want everyone to do well. Well, my all-time favourite driver is Daniel Ricciardo. Um, just because I think, that, um, apart Good from... Choice. Yeah, just because apart from the, you know, like all the sex and drugs and cigarettes with James Hunt, as it were, I think they both did do amazingly for the sport. Um, they're both amazingly great race drivers. And like with Ricardo in particular, he's got this energy and character and charisma about him, which is infectious, which wants to bring people into the sport. Um, it's like you don't remember a driver who's, you know, sort of, P9 or P8 and has really boring interviews. You remember the driver who has a bit of fun, uh, has a massive smile on his face and it does really well and performs. So when you see um, those drivers, you know, performing really great, you're rooting behind them and when they um, DNF or don't have a great race, you feel really bad for them. And that's what you kind of want in racing. You want that connection with the fans. And I think mm -hmm. Daniel Ricciardo is one of the best at that. And so, yeah, so Daniel Ricciardo is uh, my all time favorite, um, closely followed by James Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I would say two. That's two very different drivers, isn't it, in terms of personalities, anyways. But um, <laughs> but no, Daniel Ricciardo. He's a very very popular guy. Um, would you, do you have a particular Daniel Ricciardo favorite moment? Maybe like a favorite race or a favorite overtake, Ooh. perhaps, or a favorite quote that he said. Because he, he's done a lot of things, hasn't he, Ricciardo? One of my favorite yeah. moments is um, when he, in Monza when he went into the Mercedes garage with the camera. Yes, that was just <laughs> yeah when it was raining. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, quality. Yeah, so yeah, do you have one? Yeah, so that's a, that's a pure, that's a great example of like what I'm talking about. Where you know some of the other drivers would probably just be at the back of the garage, you know, drinking on their just made espresso, uh, espressos and what have you. Whereas Daniel <laughs> love a bit of fun yeah. with it, you know, when the pit guys, you know, make little boats going down the river and such. Um, I think the first one that comes to mind was probably 2018 in Monaco. Um, purely because although yeah. it wasn't like a you know with Monaco, you're not going to get loads of race action and such. Whereas he got dealt a bad hand a couple of years prior from from his own team's doing and then this one was going to be his redemption story and you know when it came in I think it was like his MGU 
H, I think, failed. Um, mm. And then him having to just defend the whole time. Like the second it came through that there was an engine issue, um, I was watching it with my friend Charlotte and we, both our hearts just sank because we really wanted the win for him and knowing from what happened before and then for him to defend till the very end, it made, made him winning just such a great redemption story. Um, there was an overtake um, I saw recently on uh, Reddit from R Ricardo as well, one of, one of his best moves. I think it was on Sebastian Vettel. I think it was in 2010, um, possibly at Monza, I think it was, where um, Vettel defines the inside going into turn two or turn three and uh, Daniel Ricciardo's on the outside and so he breaks just a little bit before and then switches back onto the inside and it's just a killer move. Um, I, ho I don't think I've got the date or the track right, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favourites. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, he's one of the best, uh, obviously, late breaking and uh, yeah, he's showcased some you know, really terrific moves uh, over the years. Is uh, Daniel Daniel Ricciardo? I mean, yeah, quality driver to pick. Um, would you ha do you have like a particular favorite Grand Prix that you've ever watched? A one where you look back at it and it doesn't have to be like an, a, a normal everyday classic, like you know, like twenty eleven Canada, mm. for example. Um, is it like a, a race that sticks out in your mind for maybe other reasons, or is it just because there is a that race just was pure race and it really enjoyed it and it was absolute carnage from start to finish. Um, I think the, well, the first one that comes to mind you know, was last year in Germany, just because it's, I think it's the first time I've watched a race you know, from start to finish and had that much sort of peculiar race action happening where everyone was kind of like on the same level, level playing field because of the rain mm. um, and everyone just you know, spinning out and crossing out or, or like even Max, you know, Max doing a full 360 and didn't lose any positions and you just, you've just seen this all unfold and I, can't, I think it was quite an early race or I can't remember what it was but I remember what, I was watching it in bed and I was just like what, what the hell is going on um, <laughs> but apart from that um, see my mind's gone completely blank that was the first one that came to mind um, yeah. I think obviously Brazil is always going to be like is always going to be a good one up there I think I think it's 2011 Brazil 2012 Brazil I think it was I think but, it was 2012 um, Brazil, I think. If, if, the title fight between Alonso and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was it, yes. Yes, that's it, yeah. yeah where, um, you know, you, you get the great reaction from... <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, from Yeah, because it was Vettel's third time winning and it was, um, yeah, Alonso with the classic meme staring into oh, nothingness. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've just <laughs> that was a mild stare. Again. again. Yeah. Horrible. Oh, yeah, that was horrible. So, I, so I think like, that was quite a nice one as well because, you know, you just see, like, you know, the relatively brand new sort of team just making their, yeah, third... Yeah, third championship, and um, obviously you know the the whole crowd and um, the ambiance of Brazil. It's just always uh, it's always grand. Yeah, exactly. Um, just like one of my like, final points on um, Formula One. Uh, the the younger generation of uh, like the younger drivers of Formula One have got some really good drivers coming through the ranks. You know, Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, George Russell. Are you excited with the, with the prospect and? The drivers coming through the ranks, and of course we've got loads in Formula Two as well, like Schwarzer and Schumacher and Dialot, and there's a decent bunch of drivers coming through uh, Formula Two and even Formula Three for that matter. Um, are you excited with the, what with what uh, Formula Formula One has to offer in the future? And maybe do you think it could draw in some younger fans? Because that's something that I think Formula One has been lacking recently with not engaging with like newer fans so do you think maybe these newer drivers who are heavily involved with like twitch and social media do you think they could draw in some newer fans and um you know keep the sport formula one and the the high hope of formula one alive yeah absolutely i mean i think if anything um sort of one of the silver linings we can take from you know COVID 19 is because we've had these virtual races and the younger drivers have taken this step of actually well no actually this this is going to work both for my own benefit and also for fans of formula ones as well um is yeah providing that content for them when nothing else is on and i think yeah younger drivers coming into formula one is exactly what the sport needs i mean we've seen it with Sebastian vettel where you know last season he got shown up by his younger teammate and this was his yeah second se second year in formula one first year in a, in a top team 
and just sort of just because you've got the years on you and you've got the experience doesn't mean necessarily you're good. I always say that like yeah, you might be driving a car for 20 years doesn't mean you're good at driving a car. You've only just driven it for 20 years. Mm. And I think yeah, younger drivers coming in is for some drivers um, like Ricardo or whoever it's sort of like a wake up call, being like oh, okay, you've got these younger guys in here who will go for that move and be a bit more dangerous, which is really good for the sport. And so yeah. some drivers will adapt to that. Where some drivers, where you know, like Raikkonen, for example, is only driving because that's something he just wants to do. And I know Raikkonen is sort of like it is a bit of a meme of like not really caring about the sport. Then it's like, well, we've got these younger guys in who are going to go for that move and try and you know make Alfa Romeo you know a higher team in the midfield. Then sort of get out of the way, really. So I think like these younger guys coming in, um, you know, like Carlos Sainz and uh, like um, Sh- um, Carlos Sainz and. Um, Oh God, I forgot his name. Um, back, Lando Norris. How do I forget his name? Um, yeah, like like them like coming almost equal last season. Um, yeah. It just really shows that like yeah, although Carlos has been in the sport longer, younger guys necessarily that's not an advantage, a disadvantage or anything. Um, yeah, likewise, you know the guys coming in from Formula Two, GP Two, like they're they're all hungry and waiting, just wanting wanting the seat. And you know you've got loads of guys you know signing to be reserve drivers, and you're just kind of hoping that soon. The older guys are going to be like, all right, let's pack it in. Let, let's let's love the uh, younger guys. Have a go. <laughs> so going back to your um, channel, um, obviously, as well as the graphics video, you also do a lot of karting videos as well. So before the pandemic was, you were doing actual karting races, uh, videos a lot of you driving and other people driving as well. But of course, now you're venturing into e-sports, e-karting races, and things like that. But just sticking with the physical karting first. And of course, also there you mentioned about your kind of your parents and your relatives doing other races, having uh, likens in other types of motorsport, of course, racing, and also your involvement in Formula E. Um, has that ever inspired you to um, try racing yourself? Of course, you have done, as I say, you have done carton races, but uh, carton videos. But have you ever wanted to do carton races? Have you ever done any carton races? Have you ever tried racing yourself? And, and what's it like kind of from your perspective? Because you talk about it and of course you made videos about it. You explained things about it on your videos. Uh, but what's it actually like from the from the other side? Your racing, if, even if that's just kart and racing. And what, what's that actually like for you? So yeah, with karting, it's, um, it's a bit of a weird one because I had to move to London for my job opportunity uh, about six or seven years ago. But because of that, it sort of restricts me in, in the fact that like I can't have a car in London. Likewise, if I wanted to go kart racing professionally, I've got really no garage area or anywhere to store it unless I moved out of London. But then it affects my full-time job. So it's kind of like this sort of, sort of um, catch-22 of like, well, I can move further out, then I wouldn't have the financial support to try and possibly do karting or anything like that. So my, that's all the whole genesis of why I do karting videos. It's basically. It's for people who want to go to their local go-kart track who maybe don't necessarily do it on a regular basis, but to try and pe- get people more into motorsport. And I think the biggest thing as well with my own karting stuff is that um, I'm not coming in as like a proper professional. Yeah. I'm not coming in as like coming off like, a oh, I'm a Formula 2 champion and now I'm going to teach you how to race sort of thing. <laughs> it's more of just like it's a whole learning curve with everyone. Um, and that's the main thing I think I want to try and do with my sort of videos It's to not talk to someone as if they're dumb or anything it's sort of giving them the information and then sort of whatever they do with it that's how they go with it so with a lot of the videos I do like so a lot of my karting videos um, I do a lot of track reviews and that's purely just on the basis of that not many of these co-karting tracks have much of an online presence only apart from like being in a google web search or something like that and so what I want to do there is try and give the viewers much information as possible you know whether that's um, what the go-karts there are like what the track conditions are like as well what you are going to expect when going there because you know some tracks you know they might give you like a full helmet balaclava gloves a race suit whereas some places will just give you um, a helmet and uh, overalls and that's it um, and so it's giving you all the information so then you can sort of make your own decisions and um, yeah, the whole idea is trying to get more people into into racing where necessarily they, if they don't have the financial backing you know from rich parents or anything they can still have fun in most yeah definitely i mean yeah great advice there we've heard that from a lot of people as well um and of course we've actually spoken to a few drivers and people from the kind of the inside route and they of course start up and cart and, and at the end of the day it's about having fun but you mentioned there about of course you have to move to london and, and the cart and of course had to be kind of put aside um would you would you want to still continue carton and like what was it actually like when you were on track you know before you had to move was it an enjoy was, was the kind of the goal when you were driving to climb up the ranks through different areas of motorsport get to formula e or formula one what was your kind of 
goal before so things change, you move to London and of course you have to kind of stop cotton. Um, I think for me, my sort of route originally was going to hopefully be going down the classic car racing route. Um, mm. So as I said earlier, like yeah, my, my aunt and uncle are um, yeah, they're sort of really big into classic yeah. car racing a lot at Goodwood uh, Motor Circuit, which is such a great venue for it. And um, just before I moved down to uh, London, we were building effectively what was going to be my first car, which was uh, a classic Mini called Blue Tack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, and I think it's like the reason I would go down the more classic car route is just because of what we had around us. We don't, you don't, we didn't have like you know sports cars or you know um, access you know to Aston Martin or GT cars or anything like that. And it would be good, to obviously, to like you know climb up the ranks and such. But because I didn't do karting at a sort of a early age, which is really it's like there's a really sort of a fine amount of time when you can actually sort of do that and then you can go to go-kart tracks you know then they get sponsorship then you can go to more professional uh, shifter carts and then from there you might get picked up from a, a sort of an early small team and then go into you know the formula ranks of you know formula Renault and then Formula gp3 and and so forth and so forth and you have to sort of do that at a very young age and you know it wasn't really like a thought of mine because back then it was more about sort of making yeah. videos of um, back then I wanted to make films and yeah. animations and stuff like that. Um, whereas this was more of like a hobby and more of a side sort of fun yeah. project to do with my family. Um, but I think, yeah, if I ever was to go back into racing, it probably would be more sort of either go-karting or also like classic car racing because I just prefer that. I prefer the more history sort of yeah. cars, you know, where you have to sort of really like swing a car into a corner and um, yeah, it's just drifting around because it's got no traction. <laughs> so you mentioned there Goodwood. Um, have you got any favourite memories from Goodwood? Of course, it doesn't have to be Formula One. It can be any classic cars. Uh, I mean, it looks like an amazing venue as well. And, and, and what, what are your kind of, what are your favourite classic cars from the era? I mean, I don't know too much about all classic cars, but of course, some of them stick out, you know, the old Ferraris, the old Jags, and of course, like, the great racing up the hill, slalom through Goodwood. So what, what, what have been your favourite memories from, from uh, that event? Um, well, I got the opportunity, I think it was two or three years ago, to interview uh, Nick Heidfeld, who holds, uh, still to this day, the quickest um, hill time record he was the last person to ever drive a Formula One car at full speed up the hill before it got deemed too yeah. unsafe. So it means no one can ever really break yeah. his record. Um, but um, it was really sort of cool to interview him because uh, by that point I've been two years working in Formula E, which he was currently racing in. And you know, get to get driver's time was uh, it's like gold dust basically. We, even like Formula E or Formula One to have any sort of access to talk to a driver was amazing. So um, I literally just reached out to the guys at Mahindra who was racing for at the time and um, said, "Is it possible can I can uh, have a quick five-minute interview?" Um, sent across like you know storyboard breakdown everything, and they just like, replied back saying, "Yep, yeah, straight away." And so have to have that sort of moment with him of uh, just talking about his car of like um, who's driving up his current Formula E model. Um, going up the hill and just talk about his heritage as well of what he was actually like because I wanted to break the norm of boring sort of like you know post-race yeah. interviews where yeah. it's like oh so how did the car feel oh okay but what what are you going to try and do next time and then you have a boring driver response of like oh you know well the car is really good but you know the conditions are always changing it's, it's just yeah. boring stuff where I wanted to have a bit more fun of like so what's it like now knowing that no one else is ever going to beat your record. Like, does that kind of make you funny, feel fun when you go to a driver's club and having that aura yeah. around you sort of thing? Mm. Um, uh, so I think that's probably one of my favorite memories. I think also last year as well, um, I got to see Daniel, Daniel Ricardo. Um, sure, my family members were, yeah, they work at Goodwood as well. Um, I, I get a bit of um, special access uh, treatment, so I get to go into the um, into the sort of the holding pen before they all go out onto the uh, yeah. onto the course. And so um, got to sort of see Daniel Ricardo from afar, um, getting into um, getting into a Renault, which I was a bit like <gasps> a bit starstruck, <laughs> which is great. Um, wow. Which is weird because I don't normally get starstruck yeah. at all because um, in my line of work, yeah, you sort of have people, sort of famous people come in and out and you have to sort of just be be fine and go with it. Whereas I saw Daniel, I was a bit like, oh my God, it's Daniel. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's probably my, one of my favourite. But moments. you didn't get to speak to him. If you did, let, let's say you got to speak to him and you got, let's say you had like a less than a minute to speak to him or less than, you know, 30 seconds. If you had to kind of just oh. spit out something quick to him. What would you say? I imagine you have yeah. a lot, but you have to condense it a lot. You can't just be fast. What would you say yeah. to, uh, to Daniel if you saw him? That's a good question. Um, I think the main thing for me would be don't be boring. Don't say I'm your biggest fan. Don't say, oh, I loved you in this race. Don't, because he's, he's heard that a million yeah. times, you know, and it's like, for, for, 
it's for me whenever I, I talk to someone who is like, either like quite well known or anything, it's just to try and have the most normalish conversation and like to have to try and find a common yeah. interest because if you're wanting to like have them remember you or whatever like that or whatever you're trying to achieve or anything if you're just going to have a sort of a bland conversation about like oh so what are you driving today oh the Renault oh cool oh are you looking forward to the season <laughs> yeah grand it's sort of it's kind of a you already the questions you're about to ask you already know what the answer is going to be so why yeah. ask them so I think my sort yeah. of thing I think my um I think my sort of questions would probably be more along jokey terms of like, so when you go to McLaren next year, what sort of tricks have you got for Lando? What sort of practical jokes are you going to sort of try and do? Have you tried doing this sort of thing yeah. for like an example? Rather than sort of trying to be that journalistic thing of, um, oh, let's get to like an inside scoop. Be like, oh, so I heard Lando Norris is allergic to um, this thing. Why aren't you trying to um, sneak that into his next like fitness regime yeah. or something like that, or some some like something just a bit yeah. fun? Yeah. Because um, I think yeah, if you give him a boring question, you're just going to get boring answers. I think yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a question I would ask him. Um, oh gosh. Would you bring a, Would you bring a shoe his way? Try and get him to do the shoey again. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Like, I think like the Shuey, th- yeah, the Shuey is like is so now renowned, and like I think even him, he, he's probably thinking to himself like um, he's probably thinking to himself. Um, I wish I hadn't sort of done it now because now yeah. it's stuck. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I'm not. Sh- oh, I'm, re- I'm really stuck with what I would actually ask him. That, it feels like I've actually got pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd probably ask him. Um, I'd probably ask him what teeth whitening he does <laughs> okay. on, on a day-to-day basis. Because I don't think anyone's probably asked right. him that. Yeah. So I'd probably say to him, I'm classically British and my teeth are going slowly yellow. <laughs> like, what whitening would you sort of prefer? Um, likewise, also, do you... What sort of pants do you wear? <laughs> no one's ever going to ask him that, so why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're gonna, you're gonna get, a, you're gonna get like a really good answer with that one, with Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you give him the really obscure questions like really specific ones mm-hmm. like then you'll get something out yeah, of it at least you don't go the normal way because i was i was thinking if you bring up the avocado the not funny avocado and ham oh, or whatever that, yeah, and daniel good. avocado you're not gonna laugh at that you're not gonna laugh at that but you just mentioned there matt about obviously danny rick going to mclaren this kind of the last thing you know before we end this interview um what, what's your thoughts on that i mean big move but and we've discussed him a lot, you know, from moving yeah. from Red Bull to Renault. Also, kind of, yeah, talk about his Renault move a, a bit as well. You know, what what is what's it been like for Danny Rick, kind of going coming through Renault, leave Red Bull, and and what does a future hold for him at McLaren? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because if you think about it, it's sort of personally, I think that it, it should have been the move he made um, originally rather than going to Renault. Um, I always thought him moving to Renault wouldn't be best. I can sort of understand why he wants to change. Completely get that because you know he's been in the Red Bull program since he's been a kid, um, and he mm. wanted to change, and that's completely grand. But I think yeah, him moving to Renault was a mistake of rather than going to McLaren, because um, effectively then if you look at it, it could have been like well, it would have been Carlos and uh, Ricardo at McLaren um, for that last season, and then in theory, you know, we saw Carlos get get a podium. I mean. Can you imagine the headlines of what that would have been if, like, if that would have been Ricardo? Yeah. You know, Ricardo moves to McLaren, first podium from McLaren in how long it would have been? Yeah. That would have really stirred things up. And think about the sponsors from that as well. Of like, you know, more sponsors being like, oh, this guy had just got on a podium for this team, which originally had been ruined by Alonso. Um, I mean, that would have been amazingly well for McLaren. I feel like now. When he moves in, when he moves into McLaren, I think it's going to do great for him. I think it's the right decision for him to do. Yeah. Um, him partnering up with Lando, I think that's going to be a, such a great um, driver pairing because I think both of them, although they're very cheeky and very got very uh, charismatic um, sort of outputs, I think both of them on track though have sort of bring that to them and have a bit more fun with it. And um, I think yeah, I think McLaren are going to do really well with them two together. Hopefully, we'll see. Maybe t- I'm going to predict hopefully two podiums from them in their season if they if they go the way they're sort of going at the moment um, not any race wins or anything they still got a lot more time uh, to go for that um, but yeah I think it's a I think it's a great pairing and I just just kind of wish he did it a bit sooner yeah definitely it should be it should be a good pairing um, and final thing as well um, 2020 championship it's a quirky season 
um, you know, we should look. We hopefully next year we look back and laugh at this season of being very weird. But there is going to be a champion at the end of the day, and um, who is that going to be? Are we looking at you know, as I say, quirky season, quirky guy that could win it, or is it just going to be playing old Lewis Hamilton going for seven again? Uh, what's who's going to win the championship? So it's kind of twofold. Like it's it's basically got a driver who I think is going to win, and then a driver who I want yeah. to win. Um, so I think realistically, it's going to probably be Lewis again. Um, I think like he's he's not shown any weakness in that car. He's he's performed amazingly. Um, the only thing that might be different is obviously we go into some new ch- new circuits um, and some other circuits which Lewis was potentially better at are now being cancelled for this season. Um, so the other drivers got that sort of in their favour. So, but I think yeah, it's going to be a boring answer. But I think Lewis is probably going to win the yeah. season again. But if 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 it went the right way and Ferrari actually sort of protected their driver a bit better I think the chink Charles Leclerc has also got a good shot because I think last season if Charles had the priority over Vettel then they would have been much higher in the championship but they they kept prioritising Vettel over over Leclerc and Leclerc still outscored him so now we're going into a season where it's now from contracts and from you know obviously Vettel leaving it's now dominant that it's now obvious that um, Leclerc is now the priority main focus so now he's got that under his belt he's got a great momentum so I mean, this is all spitballing. We we we, might, we, we don't know until we actually get yeah. racing. Um, for all we know, yeah, you know, the new Mercedes car might be completely yeah. rubbish. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I think Lewis will probably take it again, unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, just because like, it would be nice to see a new championship winner. Um, but hopefully, if that is the case, then it'll be Charles. Leclerc. Well, yeah, hopefully. I mean, it sounds like a good season. Obviously, we've seen what the W11's been like, but it's been a long wait from winter testing to Austria, and we just can't wait to get there. Uh, so, as we're going to end the interview, uh, Matt, thank you very much for being on our show. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we emailed you, and then you were straight back. We really appreciate that. That's probably out of everyone we've interviewed, honestly, sincerely, nice person because you just came back straight away with an, with an answer. You know, some people have waited days, some people have waited months, some people haven't even responded to us. So we really, really appreciate that. You know, you email back straight away with obviously a positive answer. Uh, guys, if you haven't checked our Matt's channel, please go and check it out. We will leave uh, links to his channel in the description box below. He's got so much more content coming your way, especially as he said at the start there. You know, we finally have something to talk about. Our content creators, we finally have racing back. Of course, keep a big eye open for his uh, graphics. You know, that's definitely going to change the dynamic of Formula 1. And I definitely, definitely, definitely think, Matt, that you will get your graphics on official Formula 1. It will be on the telly, it will be all over the news, and it will be <laughs> talked about by David Croft, Martin awesome. Riddle, all the big wigs of F1. Uh, yes, thank awesome. you very much for being on our uh, interview. Have you got any final words uh, for uh, anyone watching? Um, uh, uh, oh, you don't have to. <laughs> it's just, it's just uh, a formality. You don't have to say anything. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, drink plenty of water, uh, wear sunscreen when it's sunny outside, um, stay safe and stay protected. Awesome. Good advice. <laughs> awesome advice. We couldn't have... Very smart advice. Very smart advice. <laughs> yes. Couldn't have said it better. Uh, anyway, guys, obviously, thank you very much for watching out there. We hope that you've enjoyed uh, this interview. Please, if you do like what you see around here, please like and subscribe to the F1 Debate Show. We have so much more content coming your way, including the racing in Austria in a fortnight's time. It is incredible. I mean, what is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Formula One is back. It's been a long wait, but we are finally here. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait. Anyways, thank you very much for watching this episode. And until next time, guys, we'll see you later. See you later, guys.